meditating this week on after fasting. How many of y'all fasted with us? Wasn't that fun? Uh, one more thing, very quickly. If you're visiting with us, we have a wide open back door where every visitor card ever gets eat up somewhere. They never get turned in. So if you're visiting with us and you filled out a visitor card um, and you still have it in your hand, just make sure, please make sure we get that. We, we, we really want to get that. In fact, if you'll turn that in, Uncle Jim will send you a check. <laughs> Debbie holds the checkbook. <laughs> One of the greatest temptations... Follow me now. We're going to be in uh, 2 Kings. If you want to go ahead and turn there. 2 Kings chapter 2. I just feel like I really need to encourage uh, the, the root systems today. Does that make sense? I want to encourage your root system. I want to encourage you. And I, I felt like some of the greatest revelation I got this week and some of the, some of the greatest moments we had in the Lord was also some of the hardest attacks that I've had. And some of the frustrations that I had began to bubble to the top in this in this fast. A lot of them was from not eating. That was my frustration. <laughs> uh, one of the main ones. My wife and I were very cordial in our house. I don't know about you. But I'm not. We were like, Rrr. what kind of broth do you want? Chicken or beef? <laughs> So, but, but I want to I teach you because I think it's important to encourage you to stay the course. To not let your foot off the gas. To not stop doing what you know to do. To not stop being aggressive in your pursuit of the Lord and what he has for you. You understand that? If you let off at all, you'll end up so far behind you won't know where you're at. And it's important that you hear every now and then you hear an encouraging word that just tells you keep doing what you're doing. Keep doing what you're doing. If you don't slow down, if you would just endure and continue to do what you know you should be doing, don't allow the distractions. Don't be conformed. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so don't allow the world to conform you and, and slow you down. And the greatest hindrance, listen, the greatest temptation that you and I are going to face, and I prophesy over the next three months, the greatest temptation that you and I will face over the next three months is not going to be from people who are not saved, pushing us and pressuring us. It's not going to be sin. Can I tell you, if you're struggling with sin and you've been connected for more than six months or more than a year, then the issue is you're not really connected. Right. Amen? Amen? A vine or a branch that is connected to the vine, it dies while it's still on the vine when it stops connecting to the flow that's coming through the vine. Yeah. And so if you're still struggling with little things, then there's an issue there that has to do with the connection because there's enough going on around here yeah. to keep you out of sin. Yeah. Amen. If you showed up to everything we do, you would never have to go to work because you'd be here all the time. Well, you'd have to, but, but you wouldn't be able to. And so I want you to understand the greatest issue that we're going to face over the next three months is not going to come from sin issues. It's not going to come from people who aren't saved or people who need Jesus. The greatest issue you're going to face is from religious people. Hear me. The greatest issue you're going to face is from religious people who their comfort is being disrupted by your commitment. One of the greatest issues you're going to have is when you continue to push deeper into God and continue to run after him and you continue to read and you continue to fast and you continue to give and you continue to participate and you continue to be a part of everything and you're showing up here on Monday and Tuesday night and Wednesday night and Thursday and you're coming to help with the ladies auxiliary bake sale or whatever it is that we're having. <laughs> When you're showing up to all these things, the greatest push you're going to find is going to come from people who love God but don't see why any of this is necessary. Yeah. Amen. And you've got to determine, and I'm encouraging you today, to determine within yourself, I'm going to dig in deeper. I'm going to push deeper. I'm going to push. I'm going to read more. I'm going to pray more. I'm going to give more. I'm going to fast more. I'm going to do more because out of my heart, I know that my doing more is positioning me. It's not changing him. It's positioning me yeah. to receive more so that I can be more. Yeah. You hearing me? 
Y'all getting this? So listen, th th this is going to happen. When you begin to tell your family that you can't make it to a birthday party because of revival. Amen. I know you got a birthday party scheduled at 1030 on Sunday. But I do go to church. Yeah. Right? Amen. And you start dealing with the kickback from people that look at you and say, oh, you can miss this one. It's okay. And you start dealing with issues where you got people that are saying, well, we we're inviting you over to this. And you have to look at them and say, yeah, I would be there. But we're having this thing at our church and the Lord is pressed upon me to be there. And there's something going to happen. And you have to tell your friends and your neighbors, I can't come to this and I can't do it. Well, you're sounding a little judgmental. You're sounding a little uh, compartmentalized. You're sounding like you're telling us we have to choose and we have to eliminate some things. from. I know I am because revival is expensive. Yes. It's very expensive. But the benefits of being able to look at someone who has a need that money can't fix and fix it is far worth the cost. Amen. And so when you're faced with these opportunities where the pressure's there, you're going to have to tell your friends and your family, you know what? I love we're going on vacation, but some of us are going to have to decide we need to come back Saturday instead of Sunday because I have somewhere to be on Sunday. Yeah. I want to reach my family, but I neglect the church every time my family calls. Yeah. They need to see Jesus, but I skip church every time they ask me to. Instead of taking a stand and saying, no, 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 you need to see how important this is in my life. Jesus said, straight is the gate and narrow is the road yeah. that leads to life. Yeah. That has nothing to do with going to heaven. Nothing to do with going to heaven. It has everything to do with getting heaven here. Yeah. He says, few people actually find that. That's not about heaven. I think a lot of people are going to heaven. But I think a lot of people have to live in yeah. eternal hell while they're here before they get there. Because yeah. they right. choose to not pursue Jesus. Amen. You hearing me? You're going to get the greatest rebuttal from people who are satisfied in their religious system and require, that requires nothing from them because movement always disrupts stagnant water. Yeah. Anything that begins to move will disrupt anything that's sitting still. Amen? Amen. It's going to disrupt it. How many of you have already felt that persecution from loved ones? About half of you. I'll see why you go there. <laughs> Sunday morning is good enough. <laughs> For you. Not really. You ain't got to be there every time the door's open. <laughs> you ain't got to be at the bar every time the door's open either. This is not right. <laughs> <laughs> That's my girl. <laughs> it's amazing to me the number of people that I talk to that think the government doesn't have to worry about the homeless. The church should take care of the homeless, which I agree. But also says the church doesn't need any money. I'm not giving my money to the church. All that church wants is your money. No, it's not all we want. We want everything. Amen. So you need to be, listen, the reason why that's important is because you need to be confident enough in who you are as a son or daughter of God and in the thing that God has put inside of you so that when the pressure comes and the test of God comes, because that's really what it is, the test of God comes, that you are able to make a decision based on value. Right. And when you convey your decision based, the greatest witness you can give to people that you love is to show them what you value. Yeah. Amen. If you value them, you spend time with them. Yeah. Correct. Yes. Don't tell me you love your wife if you never spend time with her. <laughs> I should have got a lot more out of that one. I thought, man, that was good to me. I thought that might have just been for me. Sorry. Y'all must be doing it right. <laughs> when people, listen, the reason why I want to encourage you about that, because it's important. When people begin to pressure you to slow down in your pursuit of God, I want you to have your Bible with you. And I want you to get your Bible and with all sincerity and with all honor, but in sincerity, I want you to hand your Bible to them and I want you to ask them, show me one verse that justifies 
why you're saying that. What? There's 66 books and thousands and thousands of stories, thousands and thousands of principles being taught. Show me one verse that justifies your position, one sentence that justifies your position. Yeah. Just show me one. Just show me one. And you know what? And then I'll slow down and be balanced. Right. Just show me one. Yeah. Come on, amen. Amen. Because really, what not what that, that's not what people want. They don't want you to slow down because they think that you're too much. They want you to slow down because they're convicted because they're not doing what they know they need to be doing. Amen. Come on, amen. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm trying to give you the hope to continue to push deeper and deeper. You hear me? So people are feeling bad about the conviction the Holy Spirit's putting on them because you're doing something that they should be doing or something that they used to do. One of the things I try to tell people a lot of times when I'm counseling them, especially uh, Austin was doing it the other day with somebody we were talking to, is how would the, per the you a year ago feel about where the you today is now? Yeah. How would the you a year ago feel about how where the you today is now? And if it was any different, then we need to remember, we need to go back to those places. Jesus said, wisdom is justified by her children. Wisdom is justified by her children, meaning the things that you do, the decisions you make. Curse, you ever made a bad decision? Once? Maybe twice? Twice. She said twice. Twice. Two times she's made a bad decision. When we're making bad decisions, all of us, well, I don't say all, most of us know they're a bad decision. Right. Yeah. But sometimes we make a decision thinking we're right. And then later it turns out we weren't as smart as we thought we were. Amen. The Amen. reason why we find that out is because it produces a fruit that does not look like wisdom. The choices we make are not deemed wise or foolish in the moment we make them. The choices we make are deemed wise or foolish by the fruit that it bears. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Amen. Pyramid schemes, right? <laughs> right? Just get it. $100. You can get in on this. It's going to be awesome. You'll make a million in the first week. Sure, take my money. And a week later, you're like, right? That's a wise decision if it gives you a million back. But it's a stupid decision if a week later, you're like, nothing to show for it. Because wisdom is not in the decision. Wisdom is in the fruit that is born of it. See where I'm setting you up for? And so you can look at the pressure that comes from people who are producing nothing that is telling you, you need to slow down and be more balanced. How do you balance the Bible with this life? It's imbalanceable. It's the poster child for imbalance. We're close to something. You hear me? I said you're close to something. Yes, amen. You're close to something. You're close to something that is already here. You're close to something that is already here that is actually already in you. Do you know that when Jesus, when Jesus, we keep praying for the river of God to flow, right? Mm -hmm. He sang about it earlier. Yeah. The river, let the water, let the river flow, let the river flow. We're praying for the river to flow. Guess what? The river in the Bible comes out of you. Amen. Right. Jesus said out of your bellies flows rivers of living water. And we're praying for something that's already inside of us. And all we have to do is release it. Why is that important? Because Ezekiel tells us everywhere the river flows, there is life and there's healing for the nations that is found in the river of God. Yeah. And could it be that the reason why we're not seeing what we need to see is simply because you won't open up and let out what's already inside of you? Amen. Come on, man. Yeah. Why won't you let it out? Because I'm too bombarded by things around. I haven't even got to the scripture yet. <laughs> Help us, Jesus. <laughs> Second Kings 2. Yeah. <laughs> Your yes matters. I say your yes matters. Amen. 
your yes to loving on these kids and praying with them and getting in the altar with them matters. Your yes to worshiping God matters. Your yes to being faithful to God matters. All these things matter. Come on, when they, you don't know what they've been through when they're sitting down here and they're on their knees and they're struggling with things and we look with a judgmental eye and wonder why and we wonder what's going on. Listen, friend, there is something in our yes that heals all that. If you'll just say yes and come and wrap your arm around them, they just need a daddy sometimes. They just need a mama sometimes. They just need someone to be available and be burning and be ready. Say Kings chapter 2. I'm going to hurry, hurry, hurry. Stay focused, Clark. <laughs> Uh, verse 13, <laughs> he being Elisha, we're talking about Elisha, took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan River. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and he smote the waters and said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither. And Elisha went over. And when the sons of the prophets, which were to view at Jericho, saw him, that's King James, Sons of the prophets were watching. That's what it means. <laughs> they said, the spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him. <coughs> and they bowed down themselves to the ground before him. And he said unto them, unto him, behold now, there be with thy servants fifty <coughs> strong men. Let them go, we pray thee, and seek thy master, lest peradventure the spirit of the Lord hath taken him up <coughs> and cast him upon some mountain or in a valley. Let me, let me break it down to you in modern English. What he's saying there is, listen, we saw Elijah go up. We know you have a double portion of his mantle, but we're afraid God dropped him. So we're going to take 50 strong men and we're going to go look for him just in case the Lord did drop him because if he went up, he's got to come down. That's their theology. That's their reason. So they cast him upon some mountain in some valley and he said, Elisha says to them, don't go. You shall not sin. And when they urged him, Till he was ashamed. He said send them. Then they sent there for 50 men. And they sought three days. But they found him not. Because he wasn't there. And when they came again to him. For he tarried at Jericho. He said unto them. Did I not say go not? It's the story of Elijah and Elisha. Elijah and Elisha. Most of you know the story. If you don't. Just a quick recap. Elijah is in the cave. He is hiding from God. He is depressed. God comes to him in a still small voice. He whispers to him. He tells him to go anoint Haziel to be king over Syria. He tells him to go anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, to be king over Israel. And then he says, go anoint Elisha, the son of Shaphat, to be the prophet in your place. So he passes by Elisha. The Bible says that Elisha was plow, uh, plowing behind 12 yoke of oxen. How many of you know what a yoke is? It's a, it's a tool that connects two animals together that they have to walk at the same pace to accomplish the goal that is put inside of them. There's 12 yoke of oxen. Elisha is working behind. The Bible says Elijah passes by him, lays his cloak on him, his mantle on him, and he casts his mantle on him, and he doesn't say a word. He just puts the mantle on him and keeps walking. The man is working. He's earning his living. He is sweating. He is managing these two oxen or these 12 yoke of oxen he's managing all this and a man who he does not know walks by him lays a cloak on top of him and keeps walking picture this in your head he doesn't say a word but Elisha goes and kisses his family goodbye he kills the oxen sacrifices them cuts up the plowshares and burns them the things that he was actually working with, he burns them. Come on. He burns them because this thing that God has called us to do was never something that we were supposed to participate in for a season. And then when things get hard, we go back to plan A. This thing that God calls us to be a part of is not something that we participate in as long as the church is helping me with my finances or as long as the church is doing it or as long as the church is growing or as long as it's happy. Or as long as the music's good, as long as we have people doing their thing. And, and then just in case it backfires, I've always got the plowshare to go back to. <laughs> This thing is about understanding that when Jesus calls you, there is no plan B. There is no going back to what you used to do. Because, listen, things were never meant. That, as, as long as you have, let's say, okay, plan B in my pocket. 
As long as I've always got plan B in my pocket and escape route, I'll always be looking for reasons to disconnect from plan A. Right. As long as you never see yourself as family, you'll always have a reason to leave. Right. I can never leave my mom. She's always going to be my mom. Right. No matter how crazy she gets, how crazy I get, I can never disown my father. He will, it doesn't matter what I think, he will forever be my father. He will forever be my father because we are connected through family. And when we get the understanding that when we commit to being a part of something, God writes it in stone as covenant and we are to adhere to that and we are to follow that. And if we would, if we would listen, if we would connect to each other in a way that says it doesn't matter how hard this gets, I'm not jumping ship. I committed to being a part of this thing. We're going to see what God wants us to see. Why is revival Terry? Why do we not see what we're supposed to see? Because people split. Because people don't stay the course. Every single denomination in the world is something that has been birthed out of a disagreement. Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't birthed out of purity. None of them were. Yeah. Right. Every one of them are birthed out of disagreements. I can't understand what you're doing. So I'm going to do my own thing. And I go back into my other plan. And the reason why a lot of us cannot overcome temptation. And we stay on the sin cycle. Who am I talking to? We stay on the sin cycle. We stay on that thing. We cannot grow. We can't find a good job. We can't find a good spouse. It's because we always have the old way that we go back to. And we wonder why the old way doesn't produce something new. The old way is never going to produce something new. <laughs> it's amazing because when pressure gets real, we always... I, I, let me prove it to you. How many of you uh, at one time quit smoking? Whatever it is, you quit smoking. <laughs> right? Then pressure comes. Something bad happens. And the first thing you do... I need a cigarette. Nope. Yep. Or something else. I did not say Siri. Shut up. <laughs> the screen went black and said, what would you like? 